As I began prepping for this message, I kept coming back to this word, new. I started my computer, opened a document, and right there at the top, there it was, new. As I clicked on it, I thought about this idea. There's a whole new page. Nothing has been written. So many possibilities, so many directions I could go. It's exciting. It's also scary, even a little bit overwhelming. Because Sunday is coming and the page is still blank. There are so many directions I could go, so many options. Which way do I go? God, I need you to give me some direction. I need you to show me what to say. Give me something, something new. God is a God of new things. Of course, he never changes. He's always the same yesterday, today, and forever. And yet, at the same time, for a God who never changes, he sure does like to change things up sometimes, right? And he does new things in our lives. And when we really get a new picture of him, when we really have a new encounter with God, you know what happens? God begins to change our perspective. We get a new perspective. So everybody say, new perspective. Come on, when we really see God, guess what happens? In an encounter with God, he begins to change the way that we see things. He gives us a new perspective. In fact, the prophet Isaiah, God spoke through him, and he said it kind of like this. God said, behold, I am doing a what? A new thing. And notice what he says. Do you not see it? Do you not perceive it? It's right there in front of you. So many times we pray and say, God, I want you to do a new thing in me. And God goes, I'm already doing new things. All you got to do is open your eyes and you will see them all around you as you have an encounter with me. As I do a new thing in your life, as you become a new person, I begin to give you new vision. I begin to give you new perspective. That's what I want to talk about for a little bit this morning. In fact, I want to talk a little more about something that Isaiah says a little further along in the book of Isaiah, or actually a little bit before that in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you can open it up there. We're, gonna, we're just going to hear a few things about when Isaiah had an encounter with God and how it brought about a new vision or a new perspective. Let's check it out in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I what? I, like three of you were paying attention. We're going to try that again. Are you ready? All right. I'm going to give you fair warning. We're going to do it again. All right. You said you were going to help me, so let's try. All right. Here we go. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphim, or angels, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were called to, calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. I, have a, I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the angels, or the seraphim, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Man, Isaiah is a prophet of God, one of, the, one of the greatest prophets of all of the Old Testament. Isaiah was a man who was used to having encounters with God, but on this occasion, he saw God in a new way. He had a new way of experiencing God. And from that new encounter, God began to change the way that he saw things. He gave him a new vision, a new perspective. In fact, let, help me out this morning. I, I, need, I need you to raise your hand if you're here today and participate. If any of you, how many of you wear gla uh, glasses or contacts? Raise your hand. Right. Wear glasses or contacts? Okay. That's a whole bunch of you. Yeah. I tell you what, I am 47 years old. I know you think I don't look that old, but that's because you wear glasses and contacts. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I am 47 years old, and I have never had to wear glasses. Never had to wear contacts? Come on, hashtag blessed right there. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. All my family wears contacts and glasses. My wife, she wears contacts. My, my daughters both need to wear glasses. They don't always wear them, but they're supposed to. They need to, especially when they're driving. Come on, my daughter's something over here. You better be wearing your glasses when you're driving. My son wears glasses. I'm 47-year-old. 
up until about six months ago. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, about six months ago, all of a sudden I realized, like, print just started getting smaller. I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a design trend or something, but like designers started using smaller fonts, you know? And then I noticed like there's this other trend in restaurants and stores and stuff where there's like dimmer lighting, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I don't know why they're doing that. Of course, we know that's not what's actually happening. What's happening? I'm getting older <laughs> and my eyes, my eyesight is deteriorating. And so I thought, oh man, I'm 47 years old. I didn't want to have to do this, but I finally had to break down and get some readers. Oh my goodness. <laughs> And I'm like, man, I don't want no old man readers. You know, the ones that you get at the drugstore at Walmart or something like that. No, man, like I got to, for all the youngins, I got to keep my drip looking good. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I got to get, I got to get some glasses that, you know, some readers, but I wanted to look good. And so I got online and I, I how many have you ever heard of Zenny Optical? You ever heard of that before? All you that wear glasses, I'm giving you good, like they have good glasses for a good price. So I get online. And I get these readers, and I'm telling you what, man, I put them on, and first of all, I think I look pretty good, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, don't I look smart and distinguished and educated? And, and then I was noticing, actually, I think I look kind of like Pastor Max. I mean, his are kind of, <laughs> and his drip's always on point. How many know what I'm saying, right? But not only that, when I put these things on, all of a sudden, I could see things in a whole new light. I could read and I could see. And come on, there's something amazing about that, right? And this is kind of what happens with Isaiah. I mean, Isaiah is a man of God who's had a perspective through the, he had seen God in different ways. But when God showed up in a new way in his life, it was almost like, man, suddenly I can see everything differently. There's a whole new vision and a completely different perspective. Maybe there are some of you that are here this morning that you can relate to that. That maybe some of you, you've been experiencing God in the same old way, going through some of the same old routines, showing up Sunday after Sunday. But God wants to encounter you in a new and a fresh way today and throughout this year. And when you encounter him in a new way, you may not see angels and seraphim flying around and smoke kind of going and coal on your lips. And I always thought that was kind of a strange vision of God. And it may not look like that for you, but I'm telling you you when you have an encounter with God and you see him in a new and a fresh way it changes your perspective and suddenly you have a new vision a new perspective in fact I want us to look at Isaiah I want to see us a couple of things that happen when we have a new revelation of God a couple of things that change in the way that we see if you're taking notes you can write them down first of all when I have a new vision of God here's what happens it changes the way I see God in fact that's what happened for Isaiah Look at it. He says in Isaiah 6 and 1, I saw the Lord. And what happened when he saw the Lord? Man, he, first of all, he noticed how big he was. Look what he says in verse 1. He is high and exalted and seated on the throne, and the train of his robe fills the temple. When he saw the Lord, he saw how big he was, and he also saw how holy he was. Look at this in verse number two. Above him were angels with six wings and two wings that covered their faces and two that covered their feet and two that with which they were flying and they were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Man, when Isaiah sees the Lord, he sees how big he is. He sees how holy he is. He sees how close he is. In fact, we see it in verse 6 that the angel flew to him, and with the coal he touched his mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. When Isaiah has a vision of God, he begins to see God differently. And can I tell you that for a lot of us, a lot of our struggle in our life comes down to a wrong perspective or a wrong way of seeing God. Maybe there are some of you that are here today and you have not seen God as big enough. Maybe you are in some circumstances and some situations where you look at the situation and it overwhelms you and it seems too big. 
Maybe some of you have got some reports from a doctor, or maybe you've looked at the tax bill, or maybe you look at the situation in the economy, or your job, or the thing that's going on in your marriage, or that wayward child, and you look at the situation, and it seems so big that it, that it overwhelms you. Maybe it's an addiction or a habit that you can't seem to overcome, and what you really need is a new perspective. You need to begin to see God for how big he is, because how many know when you begin to see God for how great and how big and how high and how lifted up he is, suddenly those things that are happening in your life don't seem quite so big. Maybe today God wants to give you a new vision of him. He wants to show you how big he is so that you'll see how small those problems are. For some of you, maybe it's not that you don't see God as big enough. Maybe for some of you, it's that you haven't seen him as holy enough. See, sometimes we can kind of get into those places where we we kind of get a little too familiar. Maybe we come to church and we kind of go through the same routines and the same old things over. And how many know that routine is good and we should be disciplined? But how many know after a while, routine can turn into a rut, right? And maybe there's some of you that, man, you've been coming week after week after week, but you're just kind of in the rut and it's become too familiar. You're just kind of going through the motions. You know what happens when we go through the motions after a while of going through the motions? If we're not careful, we can miss out on the miraculous. In fact, I think about Jesus. I think about the way that they treated Jesus in his own hometown. The Bible talks about it in Mark chapter 6 and verse number 1 that Jesus left there and he went to his own hometown accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach to the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did, they, where did this man get these things, they asked. What's the wisdom that has been given to him that he even does miracles? But then they started saying, isn't he the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with him? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, only in his hometown among his relatives and in his own house is the prophet without honor. And he could not do any miracles there. While they didn't see him for who he really was. For how holy he really was. They treated him as familiar and as routine. Isn't he just the one that we saw growing up when he was just a little boy? And because they did not honor him as holy, they were not able to experience the miracles that he wanted to do among them. Maybe some of us, some of the issues in our life is that we don't have a right view of God. We don't see him as big enough. We don't see him as holy enough. Maybe some of you, you don't see him as close enough maybe some of you you know that you can know about him but you didn't realize you could actually know him that maybe some of you grew up in church and you learned your faith from your family or you learned things about the scripture but you didn't have a really close relationship with him and you need to realize today as he gives you a new vision of himself that as you really see him for who he is that you can yes he is high and exalted and yes he is big and yes he is holy and yet at the same time he is close and he wants to have relationship with every single one of us see when Isaiah had a vision of God it changed the way he saw God but then notice the second thing that happened it didn't just change the way he saw God it changed the way he saw himself and when I really see God, guess what? I begin to see me in a different light. And that's exactly what happened for Isaiah. When he, saw, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, what did he realize? Well, first of all, he realized how small he was. Right? It says it right there. I see the Lord. He's high and lifted up. How many know when you see how big God is, suddenly you begin to see how small you are? And the truth is, man, we can oftentimes be very me-centered kind of lives. Come on, you know what I'm saying? Like we are in the middle of our world and we got this little world and we're right there in the middle of it, right? But man, I'm telling you, when we see how big God is, suddenly we realize, wow, man, I'm pretty small. I'm pretty much nothing. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? When we get a vision of how big God is, we suddenly begin to see how small we are. And in those moments, man, all those worries and all those things that we're so anxious about and all those frustrations and things that make us so mad and all the things we're so stressed about, suddenly we realize, man, that's not that big because I'm really not that big when I see how big he is. Isaiah saw the Lord. And when he saw him, he realized some things about God, but he also learned some things about himself. He saw how small he was. Notice the second thing, he saw how sinful he was. Notice what he says. Verse number five, I am doomed. I am a sinful man. 
How many know there's something about the holiness of God? When you truly experience the holiness of God, you begin to realize how unholy you are. When you get into his presence and see how perfect and right and holy he is, suddenly you realize how much you need him and how much in need of a savior you really are. Man, I'm telling you, when you experience the real presence of God, suddenly it leads you to a place of humility that suddenly we bow down and we go, God, I'm a sinful man, just like Isaiah did. I'm so far from you. I'm so, I'm so unholy and you are so holy. And it leads us to that place, that place of humility and that place of gratitude for thank you, God, that you loved me even though I wasn't holy, that you have made me holy through your son. And this is the position, come on, this is the posture that opens up the blessings of God upon our lives. When we get to a place, a posture of humility and gratitude, that's when God can show up and work. In fact, this is what the scripture says about it in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will what? Will humble themselves and pray. Then I will hear from heaven and I will turn and, and, they, and if they will seek for my, fa- my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. See, Isaiah come to this place. And when he saw God, he saw how big he was and how small he was himself. He saw how holy God was and how sinful he was himself, and it led him to that place. But God didn't leave him, leave him in that place. As he began to reveal himself to him, he didn't just show him that he was small and that he was sinful, but he showed, them, showed him that he could be a son. That he was a son of God. In fact, this is what the scripture says in verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which had, he had taken with the, the tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Man, so powerful that when he really saw God, that he saw how sinful he was, but in that moment that God took away that sin and said, you are not a sinful man, you are now my son. In fact, this is what's so powerful about seeing God for who he really is. When we have a new vision of God, a true vision of God will shape our identity. Like when I think about this, I think about a man from the New Testament, the book of Mark, a man named Bartimaeus. Everybody say Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus. Actually, I say that was his name, but that wasn't really his name. He actually didn't have a name. In fact, three of the Gospels, when they tell his story, they don't call him Bartimaeus. They just say, a blind man, the son of Timaeus. In Mark, they call him Bartimaeus, and so many people think that was his name. But if you study the Hebrew, the bar prefix at the beginning just means son of. So Bartimaeus was not really his name. They just called him son of Timaeus. He was a no-name guy. People didn't know his name. The Bible didn't tell us his name. They only knew him by whose son he was. How many have ever experienced something like that before? You know what I'm saying? Like next week my dad's going to be here. And all growing up we look alike, kind of preach alike, things like that. And people would go, oh, you're Mike Benson's son. But then he started kind of preaching here. And when he preaches here, they say, oh, you're Chad Benson's dad. Yeah. And we've all done that, right? We've all had that. You have the same teacher as your older brother. Oh, you're, you know, you're Mike's sister or whatever, right? And nobody likes that. We want to be known by our name. And here's this guy who's not known by his name. He's only known by his dad's name. He has no name, but he does have an identity. And what is his identity? Well, the Bible tells us what his identity is. He's a blind beggar. That's what he was known as. No name, but an identity of a blind... How many would like to be known as blind beggar? Not the greatest identity, right? He was known as an outcast. In fact, when he tried to come to Jesus, they said, hush him up. Don't let him come. He's an outcast. He doesn't have a voice. He doesn't matter. And how many know, let me just tell you something today. That there are no outcasts. And there are no people that don't matter in Jesus' eyes. Come on. Jesus calls the outcast to come to him. And that's what happens with Bartimaeus. He cries out to Jesus. And it's so important what he says. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important. Because it's the first time that anybody ever called Jesus the son of David. You say, why does that matter? 
I'll tell you why it mattered. To that point, everyone had called him Jesus of Nazareth. But the reason that it mattered that he called him son of David was because the prophecies had said that the Messiah would come from the line of David. So what is happening here is that Bartimaeus recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah, right? It took a man who could not naturally see, a blind man who couldn't see in the physical to actually see in the spiritual what nobody else had yet seen. And he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And look what happens. Jesus calls to him. And in verse number 49 of Mark chapter 10, Jesus stops in his track, calls over to him. They said, call him. It's your lucky day. Get up. He's calling you to come. And notice what happens. Throwing off his coat, he was on his feet at once and came to Jesus. Why does this matter, throwing off his coat? Some people go, well, he just didn't want the coat to get in the way. He's trying to run to Jesus, but there's more to it than that. Because in those days, a person who was blind would wear a special coat. And that was what identified them as a blind person. Just like in our day, if someone is visually impaired, they'll use a white cane, right? And if you see someone with a white cane, you know that person has vision impairment, right? And in those days, they didn't have a cane. They had a special coat that they would wear. And it was what identified him as blind beggar. And yet he sees Jesus for who he is, son of David, the Messiah. And when he calls Jesus who he is, Jesus calls him to come to him. And what happens is he takes off his outer coat. He takes off the old identity, the old thing that said, I'm just a blind beggar and I don't matter. But when he saw who Jesus was, then Jesus began to show him who he was. And he began to give him a new identity in him. And of course, he healed his sight, and that's an incredible miracle, but an even deeper miracle is that he gave him an identity. See, that's what happens when we have a vision of God. He shows us who we are. Yes, we're small. Yes, we're sinful. But when we come to him, when he calls us and we come to him, he makes us his sons and his daughters. That's what Isaiah saw. That's what Bartimaeus saw, that when Jesus called him, he was no longer Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus. He was now Bar Jehovah, son of the living God. Come on, I'm telling you today, if you get a vision of Jesus... He'll show you who he is. He'll show you who you are. It'll change the way you see God. It'll change the way you see yourself. But then notice this last thing. It'll change the way you see the world. Look what it says in verse number 8. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom shall I send as a messenger to these people? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me. Here's what I want you to get here this morning. A real vision of God will not end with me. It will lead to, here I am, send me. Let me just tell you something. I want you to have a moment with God. That's our whole vision, creating moments, changing lives. I want you to have that encounter with God. But I don't want us to just have an encounter with God so we can have that feel-good moment. I don't want to just have revival night so that we can have that little revival experience and get those Holy Spirit goosebumps and everybody feel good. That's important, and I like it. I like feeling good, and I want you to feel good, right? But that's not the end of it. It doesn't end with me. When you have a real vision encounter with God, it doesn't stop with that moment that I feel it. It doesn't end with me. It leads to, here I am. Send me. God, I don't want it to end with me. This experience that I'm seeing, this vision that I'm having of God, I want others to be able to have that same vision. I want the people in my world, the people in my neighborhood, the people in our community, I want them to experience God in the same way that I have experienced God. So now I'm going to do my part to create moments for them so that they can experience God in that same way. Maybe some of you today, as you experience God, maybe God wants to begin to give you a new vision, not just of who he is and of who you are, but of the world around you. That you might begin to see your family differently. That you might begin to see your coworkers differently. That you might begin to see people you go to school with differently, neighbors in your neighborhood differently, our community differently, that instead of that's just somebody that's in my family or that's just somebody I work with or that's just somebody that lives in my neighborhood, that instead you begin to see them as that's somebody that God loves, that God wants to have relationship with, that just like he has changed my life, he wants to change their life too. 
they begin to look around and say, how can I be like Isaiah and say, God, I don't want to just have an experience with you that ends with me. I want it to end with here I am. Send me. Send me to my work. Send me to my neighborhood. Send me to my school. Send me to my family. Whatever it takes, I want you to send me so that others can have that same, that same experience with you, God. Makes us look at baptism differently. Next Sunday night, we baptize people. Many of you are going to get baptized. Like a lot of times we think of it as like it's an experience for me. And it is. Like it is. It's a good experience. It's, it's a moment. You saw it in the video. This is something I want to remember. And I know our family is going to remember forever. And that's important. And that's good. But that's not all there is to it. It's not like you're going to go into that water and come out and it's the water that made you a different person. It's not holy water. We just got it out the tap, you guys. I'm just saying. That water didn't cleanse you. It's the Holy Spirit that cleanses you. Come on, right? And yes, it's an experience. It's a moment. You do feel good and you do point back at that and go, wow, God was working in my life. But he, it's, it's not that God changed you in that moment. It's that God is already changing you and you're just celebrating it in that moment so that everybody else can see it. And instead of being about, hey, this is a me moment, it's about here I am, send me moment that maybe some of you are going to sign up to get baptized because you need to get baptized. God's doing a new work in your life, but also because you got a family member that probably wouldn't step into the doors of a church unless you invited them. I'm getting baptized. I want you to come. A neighbor, a co-worker, that when they come to see you get baptized, they think it's about a you moment. What we know is it's really about a them moment. Come on, right? And we get them into a moment where God can then begin to work into their lives and bring change in their lives. See, when, when we really have a vision of God, it changes the way we see Him. It changes the way we see ourselves. It changes the way we see our world. It changes the way we see our family. There's some of you that maybe God's speaking to your heart and say, man, I want to be the kind of dad that God wants me to be. I want to be the kind of husband that God has called me to be. I want to be the leader spiritually in my family that God has called me to be. I want to be the mom or the, I, I want to be the wife that God has called me to be. We want to help you with that in your family. This year, in fact, as we were praying about this year, and we always pray and ask God to give us one focus or one word, that's our theme for the year, that word is new. It's something that as we prayed together as a staff, God began to put on our heart is that he wants to do some new things in our families, do some new things in our kids and in our marriages and our moms and dads and husbands and wives. In fact, one of our core values, you already heard me say it today, is that we invest in the next generation. You know what, investing in the next generation is not just something that we do in kids' service. It's not just something that we do in youth service on Wednesday night. Actually, the greatest investment in the next generation comes through the family, through the moms and the dads saying, I'm going to disciple my children. I'm going to invest in the next generation, right? I mean, here's the deal is that we got your kids an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday or on Wednesday night. You got them all the rest of the time. And some of you are going, I know I do. That's why I bring them for that hour and 15 minutes. I need a break, you know. But your influence is far more than our influence. And so investing in the next generation doesn't just mean what we do on Sundays and Wednesdays. It means what we do in our families, in our marriages, how we equip and how we empower and how we help disciple you so that you can disciple your children in the next generation. We want to partner together in that over this year. In fact, so much so that as we planned this year and we said, God, what new things do you want to do this year? We just added several new things that we're going to do to invest in and equip and empower families and parents through this next year. We're going to be, you'll, you'll know a little bit more about it as the year moves on, but we're going to have a parenting seminar this year to invest in our parents. We're going to have a financial seminar to invest in your finances and help you with those things. Because how many know a lot of times the biggest challenge in marriage and in family is what we're doing with our money? Come on, right? And so we want to invest in that and help you. Then just the, the next one coming up real soon, in just about three weeks on February the 18th, we're going to start a series focused on marriage. It's called I Don't. How many know when you said I do, you also said I don't to a few things? And we're going to invest in you in that way. And as a part of that series, we're going to have our marriage weekend. How many were at marriage weekend last year or the year before? I'm telling you what, you don't want to miss it. In fact, here's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to give you a chance to do it right now. Put that, put that QR code up on the screens there. I want every husband and wife if we have that, yeah, it's coming. There it is. Every husband and wife, grab your phone. Just go ahead right now. Don't wait. You don't need to wait till no. This will help us to prepare as well. Just get signed up for the marriage weekend. 
because you don't want to miss it. We're investing in you. We're investing in families. We're investing in the next generation. We're investing in your marriage. And because this is something that we've felt like God leading us to do in this year, it has led us to making a small, slight change on our staff. In fact, um, for the past nine years, coming up in February, Pastor Cassie will have been serving here at LifeGate for nine years as the kids' pastor. Come on, isn't that cool? So cool. We're so proud of her. She's so awesome. Some of y'all are getting worried. She's not going anywhere. She's just going to have more work to do. That's what's going to happen. She's going to be transitioning from kids' pastor to family pastor. And so it's not going to change anything. Yeah, come on. That's cool, right? It's not going to change anything she's doing with our kids. She's already doing a fantastic job with our kids and built an incredible team. And she pours into our kids and takes them to camp and Sunday after Sunday and all the stuff that she does. But it's just going to just widen her responsibility even a little bit more. And all these seminars and all these things that we're doing for families and marriages and all that, she's going to be responsible for that as well as several other things we'll be rolling out through this next year, resources and things to just help you to be the kind of families that God has called. And she's going to be the one that's going to be championing, championing that, championing that. Is that how you say it? I speak for a living if you couldn't tell, you know. But she's going to be the one leading all of that, and we're really excited about that. See, as we see God in a new way, He begins to do new things in our lives. We see Him different. We see ourselves different. We see the world different. Thank you for joining us online today. Make sure and hit subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for more notifications. We can't wait to engage with you this week.